Hello Interwebs, welcome to Let's Fix Computers. Uh, today I've got a, uh, a HP 15, oh, it's underneath the battery, 15-P246 laptop. Uh, and this is, um, uh, this is a second-hand laptop that I have acquired, uh, and I'm going to refurbish it today. So, um, uh, to my knowledge, there's nothing wrong with it, although I haven't even tried to turn this thing on yet. I don't even know if it works. Um, but as you can see, it's pretty grot. We've got a lot of grot on the screen, on the keyboard. It's, it's a bit horrid. It's got an i3 in it. No idea what, what, uh, uh, what generation, but, you know, it's got an i3. So this, with, with an SSD in it, this laptop would be half decent, basically. Um, so uh, this video is going to be about me just cleaning this thing up. I've got a potential buyer lined up for it already, if I can, um, if I can refurbish it today. Uh, but in this video, I need to ascertain if this is viable or not, basically. So um, there's a couple of things that are concerning me. We've got to turn it on and just see if it actually works. Um, and then also, one of the hinges... I think it was the right hand hinge, feels a bit loose. Uh, I can feel some travel in that hinge that shouldn't be there. So we're going to have to, um, uh, we need to investigate that and find out if we've got a broken hinge here or not. We're also going to put an SSD in it because why not? Um, so yeah, let's get into it. All right, let's get a charger plugged into this. We've got a light on the charger, that's good. And we've got a power light. Good. Screen and HP logo. Awesome. Good. That is good enough for me. Uh, I would imagine, yeah, it's not coming up with a loading spinner or anything like that. This thing probably has a dead hard drive in it, um, which I'm guessing is probably why the previous owner stopped using it. What's that doing? Oh, it looks like it's actually booting to something. No, it's going into automatic repair. Yeah, there we go. That answers that. I don't care what's on it because uh, the hard drive's coming out anyway. Uh, I would not sell a laptop with a hard drive in it in this day and age. Uh, good. Cool. So am I going to clean this first? I kind of want to clean it because it's grot as hell. And I know you guys want me to clean it. However, also, I just want to take it apart and just see if um, how much of this I may or may not have to replace first before I go to the trouble of cleaning it. Uh, i tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to take it out back and airline it. Um, so I'm going to get my air compressor and blow all of the crud off of it. And then I'm going to take a paintbrush and just paintbrush it down just to get the surface muck off of it so it's not coming off on my hands. And then um, we'll have a look at it. And then once we've assessed what we need to actually do with this, then I'll actually clean it properly because I'm not going to spend... 15 to 20 minutes detailing this laptop only to find that this is a waste of my time which is why I never clean laptops before I work on them anyway because I'm not going to spend the time cleaning it if the job's going to be a bust so anyway I'll be back in a moment Right, that probably looks about the same for you guys. However, it is slightly less grossy now. Uh, let's get all the screws out the back and take a look on the inside. All right, now we've just got to go around the edges with a prying tool just to pop this top case out. And we're in. I'm hoping to find uh, 8 gigs of RAM in this thing. Because if it's got 8 gigs of RAM, I don't really need to do anything with that. Whereas if it's got 4 gigs of RAM, 
that's going to need an upgrade because again, four gigs of RAM ain't a good user experience these days. So, and the thing is, I my my general motto is I don't sell cheap computers. I sell good computers, um, and. Obviously, this is a second-hand laptop, um, so, you know, it's not going to be top of the line or anything like that. However, I don't want to sell something unless I'm confident that it will provide a decent user experience. Hence why an SSD is a must. Have I missed a screw? It feels like I've missed a screw. I missed a screw. Did I miss another screw? There we go, now it's coming off. Alright, so get my hand underneath the keyboard as soon as possible, and now I can just wiggle that out. And we'll just pop out that mouse and keyboard. And the power button, there we go. Okay, what's the story in here then? Right, those hinges are... That one's a little bit loose. I think we need to take apart the display assembly and check the hinge screws on the inside there. However, these points are all good, which is what, I, which is what mainly concerned me. So uh, yeah, good. All right, that's fine. Uh, let's take the motherboard out, and we'll just have a look and see how much RAM is in this thing. We would have found this out when we booted it into Windows anyway, but while we're here. I shall probably put some new thermal paste on it as well, actually. Because um, since the objective is to refurbish this PC, we may as well do everything that's easy to do. And if I didn't do the thermal paste, everyone would be like, Oh, you didn't do the thermal paste. So... And our survey says, eight gigs of RAM, yeah. Single module. I might see if I've got two fours and break that down into two fours. Because that will give it dual channel memory. And also it means that I've got another eight gig module lying around. So uh, that's a win-win for me. The laptop gets uh, a better memory config because this thing's never gonna see 16 gigs of RAM. And it means that I've got another 8 gig module, so I can put 16 into another laptop that would benefit from 16 gigs of RAM. Good. Okay, the fan is clean enough. I'll give that a quick brush down with the toothbrush just to get the surface dust off of it. That'll do. Let's move this to one side and we'll just re-thermal paste this uh, CPU. Yeah, didn't do too good a job of getting that out. Air compressor missed a bit. And instead of pulling upwards, we're just gently twisting. There we go. Right, that stuff was probably okay, but now it's gonna get fresh stuff anyway. Man, so much for cooling. Sigh. I'm just squirting some isopropyl alcohol, or rubbing alcohol, onto this thermal paste just to soften it up. It's not critical to have any kind of um, removal stuff for this, just makes it a bit easier.
In case any of the eagle-eyed viewers are wondering why I've reverted back to my old mouse mat on this bench from uh, the nice one I had, it's because of jobs like this, basically. I found myself having to cover up my nice mouse mat so often that I'm like, there's not much point in me having it on this bench because I'm always covering it up to keep it nice. So I've moved that onto the bench behind me where uh, my demo rig is. So still got it, still got it out on show, just not suited for this one, unfortunately. It's too nice for it, rather. Arctic Silver. I always want to call this Arctic Silver. Believe it or not, Arctic and Arctic Silver are two completely separate companies that both make thermal compound. How there has not been a lawsuit over that will always be a mystery to me. Either way, this is Arctic MX4, which is a very good all-round thermal paste for general use. There we go. That is sorted. Any other scruffy spots on this motherboard that I would want to do something about? I don't think so. There's dust in the corners and things like that. If you really wanted to, you could go over the entire circuit board with a toothbrush. Heck, you could drop it in an ultrasonic cleaner if you wanted to, but it's not gonna make it go any faster in this instance, so not super fussed. And you know what, while we're here, normally I wouldn't bother, but for the sake of the video, let's just uh, check on the BIOS battery as well. A lot of people replace these things just on principle. Um, I don't unless they're low, because j nine times out of ten, they'll last the lifetime of the computer anyway. 2.9, it's fine. It's a three volt cell. If that was down to like 2.7 or something like that, I'd be like, yeah, it's getting low. Let's replace that. It's fine. Right, uh, I'm going to go and get some different memory modules. No, never mind. I just had a look and I don't have a nice matched pair of four gigabyte modules. Uh, I've got a couple of four gig modules that are DDR3 um, 1.5 volts, uh, or rather, you know, this is DDR3L low power. I've got some non low power modules, but they're not matching. One of them's 10600 and the other one's 12800, which is what this is. Um, so, uh, I could put them both in and they'll probably work, but also one of the modules has got a question mark on it in Sharpie, which means I've put that there, which is one of my markers to say, I'm not sure if this works or not. I'm just leaving that there. It works, there's nothing wrong with it, leave it alone. I'm going to take the display assembly off now and just inspect the hinges on that, because as I say, there's still a little bit of play in these hinges and that might just be old age, and that's fine with me. I don't mind a bit of playing hinges if it's old age, because that's nothing to really be concerned about. However, if the screws are loose on the display assembly side, that is something to worry about, because that's going to lead to broken hinges. So, we'll just take this off and give it an inspection. It's a good opportunity to clean the LCD as well, because there's some grime on the LCD that I think is going to be right down into the sides. And it'll be easier to do that with the, uh, with the bezel off. Ah. Bloody DC jack. Get out! Get out! Get out! Ah. There we go. Yeah, this is uh, this uh, <clears throat> this bezel is glued in along the bottom with some double-sided tape. It's quite common on thin 
displays like this. Um, I am going to continue trying to remove it. There's two methods to approach this issue. Um, method one, which I'm going to try first, is to come in at the bottom and then peel backwards, if you see what I mean. If not, I'll have to just try and cut along the tape. Sometimes this peels a load of the film off from the front of the LCD. Uh, it's really horrid when that happens, but if you're careful, it will not actually ruin the LCD. It's just a plastic film cover. So if, that, if that's what it comes to, then so be it. Yeah, I think this is going to come off the horrible way. Ooh. Let's try going in there with the uh, razor blade. No, nope, that's not going to help me. It's really tempting to go in with a blade along these uh, strips. But the problem with that is, is that if you slip, you'll just cut the LCD up. So sometimes going in with, the, with a blunt prying tool is sometimes the best approach. If anyone knows any other techniques for dealing with this, I'm open to suggestions because this is quite a common occurrence and it's very difficult to do it in a way that's not horrifying. If you've got a broken LCD, then obviously um, you don't need to worry. However, if like me, you're just opening for maintenance, then uh, yeah, it's a bit more horrifying. Oh, there we go. I think we're making progress now. Ah, uh, there we go. Yep, there, it was that hinge that the cover that was holding me up. Yeah, there we go. Now watch this be a waste of time as I discover that these screws are already tight. That's tight. And that's tight. This was a waste of time. Oh well. These hinges are fine. That bit of flex that I was feeling, that was literally just flex in the chassis and the hinges and everything else. So. Oh well. However, this was a waste of time for me, but perhaps it won't be a waste of time for you if you're refurbing a laptop. Okay, so what I'm going to do now, while I have got the hinge off, we'll, uh, we'll just address this bit here. Um, so I'll be cleaning this screen properly once it's all assembled, but where this has got just gotten down beside, behind the bezel, uh, I'll clean this bit up specifically. So I've just squirted a bit of uh, window and glass cleaner um, onto my cloth, and I'll just wipe that edge down. So I'm not worried about sterilizing the screen right now because we're going to clean the whole thing properly when it's reassembled anyway. But I just want to get all the grime that's gotten behind the bezel off because obviously that's the bit that you can't get to once the laptop is assembled. There you go, you can see that discoloration there. Yep, that's good. The rest of that will clean up when we give it the final wipe down. The reason why I don't wipe it down now is just simply because I'm probably going to put fingerprints all over it when I'm reassembling anyway. It's inevitable. So it's easier to clean when you're actually finished with the laptop. And I'll give these screws just a bit of bite because they are structural to the hinges. So if these screws are here, you do actually want to make sure they're done up properly. And I'll put the one cover on. The other cover is missing, but nah. Yeah, see, this is the other reason why I didn't bother sterilizing the LCD with the bezel off, because the bezel needs cleaning anyway. So one way or the other, you're going to have to do it all again. Okay, let's put that display assembly back on.
Okay, that's our motherboard in. Let's pull out this hard drive. That is definitely going to be the original drive for the laptop. So I'm not even going to bother testing this. It's just coming out. Uh, as I say, I'll stick this in the scrap pile. Um, well, I'll put it in the spares pile. Sometimes, sometimes a spare one terabyte hard drive like this is exactly what you need. Not very often, though. <laughs> And now I'm going to stop working while I wait for the Amazon man to show up with my SSDs because uh, I've run out of 500 gig SSDs, which is what I want to put on this. Back in a mo. Ask and ye shall receive. The Amazon man has arrived not five minutes after I hit the pause button. Uh, so I'm putting in a crucial BX500 into this, uh, which is the 480 gigabyte variant. So this is a cheap SSD. Um, however, the reason why I buy these BX500s uh, in the 480 gig variety is that if the device doesn't really warrant putting a one terabyte SSD in it, then it's probably not seeing enough uh, data transfer to warrant putting in a decent SSD. And when I say that this isn't a decent S and when I say a decent SSD, I don't mean to say that the BX500 is bollocks. It's just if you're putting this into, say, a workstation where you're going to be reading and writing a lot of data all day, every day, you're shifting lots of stuff, you're transferring lots of data around, this guy's probably not what you want in there. However, th this laptop is going to be used by the kind of person who just sits and browses the internet, does their online banking, reads their emails, that kind of thing. And in an instance like that, these are fine. They're absolutely fine. Uh, and uh, they're about £10 cheaper than something like an MX500. And you might go, oh, well, that's only £10. And if it's your laptop, then sure, spend another £10 and stick an MX500 in there. However, I'm in business to make money. So obviously for me, I'm not going to put in excessively over specs components into devices that I know don't need them. So keep that in mind. So this isn't a matter of cheaping out. It's just a matter of looking at what the device is and what you think the device actually needs in real life. Because if I start putting in premium components left, right and center, suddenly this laptop is going to cost a it is going to cost an unreasonable amount of money for this refurb job and I'm going to find myself making no profit on it at the end of the day. All right, before I put the keyboard back on, I'm just going to uh, wet a cloth and just go around these edges just so we can take off all of this dirt and grime that's from the sides. While most of it isn't visible when the laptop is closed up, a little bit of it is. And that just brown line that you see around the edges of electronics, that makes things look very grimy, basically. And you'll see that on like mice and like, you know, on keyboards, like on trackpads, you'll see, it, well, you can see it around the edges of this trackpad and stuff like that. That just line of brown that just makes it look icky. So I'm going to just try and get rid of that as well. And while I'm at it, I'll go around this bit with the toothbrush um, because, uh, yeah, and in fact, I'm going to go over the whole keyboard with the toothbrush uh, before we do the final wipe down afterwards just to get as much of this uh, off as possible. Once again, I'm spraying directly onto the cloth because I find that tends to be more effective when you're trying to clean a, a narrow area. Go, that's a lot nicer. How hard is it to remove that trackpad? Mm. It might just be two screws, actually. You know what? I think we can actually have that out. It's up to you how much trouble you're going to go through when refurbishing something. Like, to an extent, there's, there's loads of uh, quote-unquote refurbers on eBay who their definition of refurbished is they reinstalled Windows on it, jobs are good and And I'm like, that's not refurbished. That's, you know, that's, just, that's the bare minimum that you have to do in order to make the laptop sellable is to clear the old data off of it. And even then, they probably didn't do a secure erase. They probably just did a reformat, she'll be right. Um... 
However, at the same time, I'm not sure what level you have to go through before I would consider it refurbished. I'm kind of doing almost as much as I can here just to give you guys ideas on what you could be doing to refurb a device. Again, whether it's your own or something that you're selling for profit. Um, you know, it's quite possible that there's lots of people watching this who have got a laptop that is looking pretty grimy and grossy like this one. And maybe you're watching this going, ooh, these are really good ideas. I, you know, I want to make my laptop look shiny and clean again. Um, you know, maybe hopefully you can watch this and feel a bit inspired. But uh, yeah, as I say, failing that, I wouldn't consider this amount of detail work mandatory for a refurbishing job. But again, you want the, you want the device to look presentable. Once we're finished, this thing is going to look, uh, well, not like it's brand new, but it's going to look presentable. It's going to look like something that I'd be proud to put on, my, on, the, on the, the bench and say, yeah, that's for sale. And it's something that I'm proud to provide a warranty for, you know. Whereas, you know, if you're sort of, if you've left something that is so grimy and grotty and like, I think everyone in this business at some point in the past has sold a laptop that was probably not, or a computer that wasn't very well specced or had a really naff case or something like that. And it's come back in for service at one point and you look at it and you're just like, oh, this is a bit embarrassing. I wish I hadn't. I wish I'd picked another case or I wish I'd made it a bit nicer or something like that. And that's basically what I'm thinking about here. I want to sell something that when it comes back in for service or if it goes into another computer shop for service, I'm not going to be embarrassed to say that I sold it to them. Incidentally, a lot of modern trackpads like this just have this single clicker on the bottom and the left and right click detection is all done in software. So if the click doesn't work or it feels horrible, uh, then that tactile button, that's what you'd want to replace. And if you've got a hot air station, not a huge deal to replace those. You can buy these little tack buttons on eBay for not very much money. It'd be nice to replace this keyboard as well. However, um, the keyboard on this particular model is a pain in the backside to replace because it's heat staked in. It's absolutely possible to do a keyboard only replacement on this. Um, and in a way, I'm almost tempted to do so just for the sake of the video. Or in fact, I would make an entirely separate video. It's that involved. Um, however, Knowing the amount of work that's involved and also knowing that this keyboard doesn't actually need to be replaced, I'm like, nah, I'm not going to go that far. However, we will just dig all the guff out of this. You can see I'm just picking out bits of nastiness there. Go. That actually responded reasonably well to that toothbrushing. There's still lots of dirt, but that's going to come off when we actually do a proper clean on it in a moment. My main objective is just to get out some of the ingrained dust and get out the the tide marks, as I call it, where just um, sweat and grime from the fingers, it comes off onto the keys. And over time, every time you tap the key, you push that wave of sweat and grime up to the edge of the key and it goes over the edge and it sticks around the sides of the key. It's gross, but that's what happens on uh, typical computer keyboards. You know, look at your own keyboard and you'll see a little bit of that occurring around the edges. It's, it's how it be. People sweat. It's horrid. Humans are gross. Um, but yeah, we can, we can get most of that off, which is the great thing. So... Right, that's enough of that. Let's get this thing put back together again and then I can do the final wipe downs. There we 
go. Lots of clicks. Very nice. All right. Wipe downs. Let's go. So I like to turn the laptop sideways so I can go up and down lengthways on the uh, keyboard. And again, I'm going in with the window and glass as usual. And we're just going to spritz that down. Then I've got my cloth nicely folded. And with the grain lengthways, we're going to just wipe that down. Now, this is called an island keyboard because there's, as you can see, land between the keys. If you, ha if you don't have an island keyboard, um, uh, I don't have an example to hand right now, but if you don't have an island keyboard, you need to be very careful about picking up keys with the cloth when doing this, um, because as you scrub with the cloth, the cloth will catch under a key and just rip half the keys out of the keyboard. So you need to be very careful. Um, there is a trick to dealing with non-island keyboards. Um, the way to do it is, uh, while you're holding it like so, when you push away, you lift the front of your hand up, so you're doing, so if this is the keyboard, you're doing that, and then when you come back, you tilt and come back like that. So you're doing this. And that allows you to dodge the sides of the keys. And uh, it's still possible to damage a non-island keyboard that way, but it drastically reduces the damage. Either way, it comes with practice. And uh, it, might seem, it might seem silly to have a specific technique and practice when it comes to just wiping down a laptop, but when you fix laptops for a living and you, you want to clean them all up as you go, you tend to develop techniques for it. So, all right, I'll get the screen as well. Same deal there. And I'm getting all across the bezel and all around the sides and get everything. I'm being a little bit careful with these rubber bits, uh, ugh, with the rubber bits at the edges of the display, because we don't want to take those off. And change over to the dry side of the cloth. This chair has started squeaking. I'm really hoping it doesn't come up on the uh, microphone. It sounds very upsetting. Right. How's that keyboard looking? That is looking pretty decent. I'd say that's passable. Well, I'm just going to get that little area there. I think the uh, toothbrush will sort that out. Just dribble a little bit of uh, cleaning. There we go. Right. Now comes the question, am I going to remove this i3 badge? I think this i3 badge kind of looks a bit grot now, because, uh, like, just liquid over time has just gotten, has seeped into the, into the sticker and stuff like that, and it, I don't know, it's crooked and I don't like it. I'm going to take it off and we're just going to debadge this thing. So I'm just going to get a knife and just slide in under the side there. Just take as much of that off as possible. Don't panic if there's a big old sticky mess behind. That's gonna happen when you remove stickers like this. And now what we do, we get our <clears throat> we get our alcohol again, and we'll just put a puddle of alcohol on that. Just let that soak in. And then we'll just sticky stuff remover the rest of that off. I use my fingernail just to scrape up the edges here, because your fingernail makes for a really good scraper when working on plastics like this. Don't bite your nails, people. They're really useful. There we go. Off in one go. Now, we've left a bit of a tide mark behind, but Personally, I think that looks nicer than having a really grotty badge there. Uh, if you disagree with me, then you can leave your badge intact. But, you know, that's the thing. We each work to our own standards. There we go. 
Right, and I'm pretty happy with that. I'm going to make one more pass. Can I do anything? There's uh, hmm. there's some marks on the palm rest here. This looks like it's like super glue or nail varnish or something like that. That I'm not sure what to do about. I don't think that's going to come off without making even more marks. So I'm going to leave that as it is. But the last thing I'll do is I'll just grab the Mr. Sheen multi-surface furniture polish and we'll just run over the keyboard with that again and that will leave the keyboard being nice and silky smooth. So we, we shield the LCD from this stuff because this stuff will smear on the LCD. If you have a glass fronted screen, it's fine. But if it's not a glass fronted screen, you don't want the Mr. Sheen on there. There we go. That is lovely and smooth now. And it smells nice too. Right, charger in and Windows 10 flash drive. Power it on. And on a HP laptop, I'm going to tap the escape key. I was too slow. So that's giving me boot device not found because there's no operating system installed. I'll just control delete that and tap the escape key. There we go. Uh, F9 boot device options. And, oh, that is not seeing my flash drive. Okay, I'll plug my flash drive into a USB 2 port on the other side. Some laptops, uh, some laptops don't like booting from USB 3 uh, because they don't have legacy USB 3 support. So let's just see how that does. There we go, Kingston Data Traveler. So, in all honesty, I can't remember if I actually connected the drive properly, which is also why I haven't put the uh, screws back in yet. So we'll find out in a moment. As soon as I've seen that the um, SSD is detected, I know we're all good, and I can just go ahead and plug it and put all the screws back in. All right, English United Kingdom. Install. Do, do, do. Always custom install. There we go, there's our SSD. Always good. All right, next, and off we go. Right, I'm just gonna quickly um, zap Windows onto this thing. I will see you guys once we hit first run, then we'll come back and we'll just put the rest of the screws in and finish up. Right, I never show my Windows setup, so let's do that as well. Uh, we're gonna go United Kingdom here. Um, I will switch to HDMI capture as soon as I'm able to at the moment, but we don't have enough drivers for the HDMI output to be working yet. So um, we'll switch in a moment. Okay, right, we've got a UK keyboard. I don't want to add another keyboard. And I always select I don't have internet on this screen, and we jump past this bit because um, otherwise it forces me into a Microsoft account login. And I want to use a local account because I don't know what the user's Microsoft account is going to be. So we will continue with a limited setup. And we'll say user. And I'm not going to specify a password. And then I'm basically going to say no to all of the optional stuff. This is all stuff that can be turned on later if the customer ever were to want it. And no, go away Cortana, no one likes you. Almost done now. We just need to get a few things polished up for you and Windows will be all yours. Looking forward to helping out. Oh. Right, and now we've hit the desktop, we're going to immediately dismiss Edge. Can I project it yet? Not yet, okay. And now we'll connect to the internet so we can start getting... Look at this, one bar. This is why I hate HPs. This thing has absolutely trash Wi-Fi. We're going to have to check that again because I can't sell a laptop with Wi-Fi like this. Um, I'm going to have a rummage around and see what I can find and we'll see what we can do about this Wi-Fi issue. 
because that's no bueno. Um, let's shut this down for now and we'll come back to the Windows setup in a moment. So the root cause of these things having abysmal Wi-Fi is that there is just a single antenna there. That's the issue and uh, with a bit of fettling we might be able to get that Wi-Fi up a little bit. Um, you know it might be that I mean, it might be there's a break in the Wi-Fi antenna cable somewhere that's causing it to be that bad. Uh, other drivers may also improve it or even a different card. Um, however, the easiest way to really resolve this problem is to stick in another Wi-Fi antenna. Um, now, routing that into the display is a lot of hassle. The display on these things is literally not designed to have a second Wi-Fi antenna in it. And I found trying to fit another cable up the side of the screen is more trouble than it's worth. But what I have discovered is that if you get another Wi-Fi antenna, um, there is actually just this dead space here. And if you just leave a Wi-Fi antenna just coiled up and just <clears throat> on the bottom of the laptop like that, that will actually drastically improve the Wi-Fi reception on the laptop, even though it's not in an opportune location. Just having it connected will drastically improve things. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to put this to one side. And I'm going to grab this grotty old compact here from my uh, breaker pile. And we're just going to take apart the display assembly and steal the Wi-Fi antennas from this thing. And then we'll have another Wi-Fi antenna to plug in. Okay, now we'll delicately coil this up, which I know is probably not the best thing to do with Wi-Fi stuff. However, trust me, it'll work. There we go, one jank auxiliary antenna install. Let's see if it works. Ah, look how quickly this thing boots up. That's fantastic. All right. There we go. And it looks much more healthy. I wonder what happens if I swap those two antennas over so the add-in one is on the main instead. Let's just see if that does, any, does me any favours. Yeah, five bars and a couple from next door as well. There we go. That'll do me. Okay, I'm going to shut this down one last time and I'm putting the screws in it. So I wonder if the main antenna is just straight up broken on this as to why it's getting that bad a reception on its single internal antenna. Who knows? In any case, as you can see, putting in a bodge antenna like that, perfectly fine. Um, yeah, it's not going to have as good a reception as your... Intel Wi-Fi with triple antennas that can reach from the end of the road and stuff like that, but uh, This is a HP. You don't buy HPs for good Wi-Fi. Let me put it that way Right, now this thing is on Wi-Fi, I'm going to go ahead and just run through the first round of Windows updates and that should get us uh, graphics drivers and stuff like that so I can start HDMI capturing and that kind of thing. 
I mean, in fact, the first thing I'm going to do is just cycle through Windows updates until there's no more Windows updates anyway. So yeah, I'll see you guys when I've done all the Windows updates. There we go. Right, now I've done enough to get um, HDMI capture. We can carry on from here. So um, there's pr I'm running out of time today, so I'm going to have to wrap up. However, uh, we should have most of the updates installed now. I'm just going to check on that. Uh, yeah, we've got to cycle through updates. If you get errors like this, don't worry about it. Just hit retry and you just keep going round and round again and again and eventually it will get all of them installed. This usually happens because there are some updates that you can't install at the same time. So you just keep going. Don't forget to go to optional updates and make sure you get all the driver updates as well. They're all tucked away in optional now. And all of these driver updates, you want to get all of these installed. That just makes sure that you've got the latest everything. So I'm going to do those in a minute when I've done everything else. For now, I'll just quickly show you the rest of my cozy setup that I normally do. Um, so what I would do next, I go to System and Notifications, and I switch off these Show Me suggestions and tips here because this stops Windows from throwing up a, oh, do you also want to do this? And maybe you might want to do this. No, I don't want to do anything. If I want to do something, I'll do it. So it just tells it not to throw up pop-ups and stuff like that. Notifications and reminders, this is fine. These are features, so that's fine. Uh, right, next I would go to Personalization, and I would go to Themes, then Desktop Icons, and I would do Computer User Files, and recycle bin on the desktop. That gives us a right click and refresh. That gives us these icons in the top left. Uh, and uh, in my opinion, uh, we don't need edge, that can go. In my opinion, I like to have these turned on on all computers because um, recycle bin is difficult to find, get to anywhere else. This PC just means that you've got a file explorer right there on the desktop. Um, but also this is because I'm an old school Windows user and I grew up with having the My Computer icon on the desktop. So that's always been something that is familiar to me. If you really want to go clean desktop, then you just right click and you do Don't Show Desktop Icons and bam, there's your clean desktop. So what I tend to do is I tend to have these things enabled and then when I want to go clean desktop, I just switch off desktop icons. And that means you can have both. You can have things switched on and if you need them, you can just show them. And then when you want to go clean desktop, you just switch off desktop icons. Job done. And it also means that the user files are right there on the desktop as well. So people can just click on that and immediately see documents, pictures, uh, music and so on. So that's right there and easy to get to. Um, I cut down the search box to an icon only because uh, I think that box is ugly. Uh, on the latest version of Windows, we've got the um, news and interests. I switched that off. I don't like it. Then if we drill back into the uh, personalization, I'm also going to go to start and we're going to go don't show suggestions, but do show the most used apps because I find that very helpful. I think that's very useful. It makes it easier to get to things that have recently been added or are being actively used. It pushes stuff that people are doing to the top of the list, which is useful. Uh, in the taskbar, I go to select which icons appear on taskbar, and I set to always show all icons. So that way there's nothing hidden down here. You can always see what's going on in the bottom right. And then while we're here, we're just going to switch off. We're going to hide Meet now because no one uses Meet now because that means you have to use Skype. <laughs> so that's that. And uh, let's see. Then in the notifications, for some reason or other, we're in, um, we're in uh, alarms only. So I'm just going to switch off Focus Assist there. I'll clear those and collapse that. There we go. That'll do. Uh, and now finally, on the Start menu, I'm going to clear these stock icons and then I'm going to click off the start menu and click on it again and then type in file to get file explorer. The reason why I closed and reopened the start menu is I don't know if they fixed it. However, if you've been changing icons on the start menu, it blocks you from searching. I'll just test that now. If I click and drag this and drag it, now if I type in file, there we go. I can't search now. So yeah. That's why, that's why I closed and reopened it. Uh, right, I'm going to put 
edge next to that. I will probably install Chrome on this, but I'll do that later off camera and then I'll replace Edge with Chrome uh, or Firefox, your browser of choice. Then I like to put the calendar next to it. And then if we scroll down a bit, the next row I put store and photos. We need to update all of these apps as well. We'll get to that in a moment. Oops, that was to pin to start. We don't want that there. There we go. And then I set that to wide. There we go. And now if we had Microsoft Office installed as well, or if we had <clears throat> some other apps that the customer was regularly using, I would put like Word, Excel and PowerPoint on the next row or Word, Excel and Outlook. Uh, or if this was a gaming computer, I'd probably put like uh, Steam, the NVIDIA control panel, and I'd find something else to put there. And then we'd end up with just a nice three by three block of icons of useful things. Um, and we put enough things there that are immediately useful, including photos that will show people stuff they're familiar with. So they go, oh, that's my stuff. I'll click on that. But also we've gotten rid of a lot of the preloaded stuff that is clutter. Windows 10 isn't as bad as it used to be. Um, so this is less important these days, but certainly in the earlier days of Windows 10, and definitely if for when we were on Windows 8, uh, the start menu was just of just useless clutter icons of free apps and free games that no one cares about. So my mantra is to clear as much as humanly possible and just put on some obvious stuff, access my files, access the internet, um, then a, a couple of filler items and some other useful apps, basically, is make, making it clean and simple. That's the objective. Because this, so when someone uses this computer for the first time and they go start menu, they immediately see things that are useful to them. That's what, that's my objective. So uh, one thing I'm going to start doing in the background, we're going to open up the Microsoft store and we're going to get this updating apps. So I'll click on the menu and hit downloads and updates. And we're going to hit get updates on that. And that's going to make sure that uh, these built-in apps are all up to date. Um, because you'll notice we've got the old icons here. So we can immediately see that they're not up to date. So those are updating. While it does that, I'm going to take a load of this stuff off. So I'm going to start uninstalling useless apps. Things like tips, right-click uninstall, the feedback hub. Come on, who's using that? Right-click uninstall. Uh, then I'm going to start moving down 3D viewer. Um, I'm going to get rid of that because I don't think the average person is going to sit and look at 3D models. Um, then let's see, mixed reality portal. Come on, how many people have got VR headsets at home? This stuff doesn't need to be installed by default. OneNote, no one uses that. The Office and OneDrive stuff, I leave that there because that's stuff that a lot of people are likely to use in the future. But yeah. Uh, then let's see, the voice recorder and the weather app, I also get rid of those. Remember, these are free apps that can just be downloaded from the Microsoft Store again. But again, what I'm trying to do is just reduce them. You could also ditch the Xbox and Game Bar um, apps if you wanted to. But I tend not to get rid of those because um, that can break certain things if you want to reinstall them later. I've had problems with Xbox Live services um, after having removed some of the live apps. So those ones I tend to leave alone. And your phone, that could go, but for some reason or other, you don't get an uninstall on that by default. It's possible to remove them. Uh, it's possible to remove them manually using PowerShell commands. However, I'm not going to go that far into this rabbit hole. It's not necessary in my opinion. Right, it's saying we're up to date, but we're absolutely not. So I'll just hit get updates again. There we go, and these are all updating in the background now. And so once that's done, I'll get rid of the mail app from the desktop as well, because that doesn't need to be there. I really hate the mail app. Um, that's something else you could uninstall, but you lose the calendar as well if you remove the mail app. Um, and the calendar app is arguably kind of helpful. So yeah, uh, good, right. Once that's done, that is basically my, my basic Windows 10 setup. There's not a lot to it, but as you can see, we've got it configured in a way where we've made sure that everything is view viewable, everything is visible, and we've put things that the next person who uses this are, is likely to want to use are front and center. So that's, that's the objective. 
Um, so that's about it. There's lots more that you can do, but we start getting into the argument of de-bloating and stuff like that. And that's a can of worms that I'm not going to go into in this video. So I'm staying well clear of that. However, uh, past that, we're basically done. So let's pull out for the camera shot. Past that, though, I'm about done with this. This thing is ready to be sold to someone. So it's got a couple of rough edges on it. You know, the keyboard has got some shiny keys on it and stuff like that. But it's a secondhand laptop, man. It's not going to be brand new unless you spend too much money refurbing it. But I hope you guys found that kind of interesting. Um, this is a laptop that I would be happy to sell secondhand to someone. And they could walk out of my shop with this and I'd be confident that they're going to have a good user experience for something that is significantly less than the cost of a brand new laptop. So that's the objective and I think I've achieved that. So thanks for tuning in everyone. As always, my support links are down in the description below or stick around for the end card for my Twitter, my Patreon, my Discord, my Instagram. And uh, I'll see you guys in the next video. Thanks a lot and bye for now.